great to be speaking to you. I got your website here, uh, tiamathealing.org, mm-hmm. up here. Um, okay, so uh, I guess I'll give you the chance to uh, introduce yourself, um, your life story, what you experienced that causes you to do the things you do now. Um, you might as well, uh, I'm interested to know where exactly you found me. Uh, it was I. Uh, you contacted me to come on the show, uh, not the other way around, and I'm glad you did because I was looking for a guest this Friday and uh, for today, and my Wednesday guest had to postpone. So uh, it's good to be doing the show now. So I'm going to let you, like I do with many of my guests, particularly guests uh, that may not be as uh, popular or well-known around the world, um, I have never heard of your site before. And, uh, well, if I haven't heard of it, I'm sure a lot of other people haven't heard of it because I try to do a lot of a lot of research. So um, let's try to change that. Let's try to give you a bit of a household name here. Um, introduce yourself, your life story, and what you experienced that educated you to do the stuff that you do now to educate people about whatever it is that you do. You got the floor. You there? Yeah. Okay. It's your turn to talk. Well, I've found myself in my life and brought into these other worlds. It's not something I ever sought out, but there have been other realities, other frames of perception, other kinds of consciousness that have come to me. And it's been a long story of trying to make sense of what is going on, trying to make sense of who we are as humans, and trying to make sense of why we're here, what we used to be, and where we are going. So originally it started as a kind of personal quest to understand how it was that I could actually communicate with other beings, how it was that I could get messages from other beings, how it was that something could tell me telepathically what I would experience the next day, or something that could know something intimate about me. This was probably when I was 18 or 19 years old that these experiences started, and at the beginning of this, I suppose I was kind of agnostic, and I didn't have a framework for understanding encounters that would go beyond the physical frame of reality. So in the last few years, I have learned how to telepathically connect with other beings, how to shift my own awareness to connect to other realities beyond the physical world. And with that, I have gained a completely different understanding of who I am. I have learned that who I was educated I was is only maybe 1% of the tip of an iceberg in an immense history and an immense journey of myself and really of everybody that I am still attempting to dissect and come to terms with. I'm not entirely sure how long I have experienced things as a soul, but I know that I've experienced many things before coming to planet Earth. And I get glimpses into these realities in which I've existed, some of them as a physical being, some of them as a completely etheric being. Um, I know that the modes of communication in many different planes are much, much different than here. They're much more direct, immediate, telepathic. Um, And humans, as much as they think they are, advanced as a race or civilization are just barely awakening to our psychic abilities, to our energetic abilities, and to the totality of who we are, basically. Thank, thank you very much. And um, first of all, your your website, tmothealing.org, just out of curiosity, um, <clears throat> the name uh, Tiamat, interested to know where that came from because there seems to be some confusion about uh, what Tiamat was and what it wasn't. Um, It's been said that Tiamat, also called uh, Maldek, was that planet that uh, was destroyed that became the uh, the asteroid belt, although uh, Zachariah Sitchin followers have it a little differently. They would say Tiamat is the Earth and one of Nibiru, the planet Nibiru where the Anunnaki come from, that one of Nibiru's moons collided with the Earth and half of the Earth uh, 
um, was formed the asteroid belt that was from the collision, and the other half is the the present Earth Yoda net today. Why his interpretation from the tablet is different than what most of the channelers and spirit workers say, I'm not sure. But uh, I just said why you chose that of all the names. Uh, why the name of a of a lost planet? <laughs> Because this very lost planet, I think, connects to what this planet can be or what it could be. Um, back hundreds of millions of years ago, we all lived on this planet, Tiamat, in a state of harmony where we were both connected to higher worlds and higher civilizations and also our physical existence. And there wasn't this break between the two. And how I understand it is when this planet Tiamat um, was split into two, we lost some of that knowledge and some of that ability. And there's been a series of attacks to this planet by um, other Anunnaki and beings who are not very benevolent to both make us forget who we are and for them to try to have this planet to themselves. And on a non-physical level, Tiamat also refers to the being or the consciousness who is dreaming this planet. There are other words for her as well. Some call her the goddess, but she is basically the creator, the creator of this reality. So saying that word is hinting both to the physical world, what it was and what it could be, and to our spiritual nature essence. Uh, cool there, and I seem to uh, judge by what you said near the beginning of that little talk there that you uh, mentioned the planets splitting in two, so you subscribe to the such an interpretation of Tiamat, that Tiamat is the Earth, and the one of the Vero's moons uh, broke the Earth in half and formed the asteroid belt, and the other half became the Earth you know today, or do you subscribe to the actually subscribe to the idea that Tiamat is the same as Maldek with the whole planet um, disintegrated and formed the asteroid belt, or are you really not of any opinion on that um, historical um, thing? Um, I would definitely be closer to Zitchin's interpretation, although I'm still trying to figure out exactly what happened. And I know there are details, but probably neither of those interpretations really take into a full account. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, like I said, it's a little bit of a mystery as to why Sitchin's uh, interpretation is a little different than what all the spiritual people say, but uh, whatever mm -hmm. they get. Yeah, there's an interesting thing about the history of uh, the cosmos. You get different stories and different time periods for things, but that's just a manifestation of consciousness, I guess. But anyhow, uh, uh, out of, for, first of all, um, you have a, uh, it seems like your site advertises a collection of healers, shamans, channelers, and other committed practitioners, although it's only you and some dude named Alexander on the About Us page on your, your website. Well, so uh, why don't you uh, tell us who Alexander is, and when you say you're a collection of healers, shamans, channelers, I mean, is he, are, are there other people that you could have um, put on this about us web page or is there some reason why you chose him or does your collective of healers refer to all your clients and, and everything well this is a work in progress i started my practice about one year ago so right now it's just the two of us and i'm very selective as to who i will take on as another practitioner and i want them to be aligned at a deep level with our goals and our pursuits and our vision so basically there are a few others who work kind of tandem with us, but the only two at the core level are me and Alex. All right, maybe someday uh, I'll have him on. But anyhow, uh, this is your time to have glory. So uh, see mm -hmm. right in your little bio here. Uh, it says you receive the most power and knowledge from the non-physical aspects of reality. Okay, well, um, I... Um, there's a lot of people that would read that and instantly become jealous and envious of you uh, and would wonder, okay, how do you do it? What do I got to do to attain power and knowledge from the non-physical aspects of reality? So uh, what's your secret, for lack of a better question, and what advice can you give to other people that can't access this stuff like you can? Well, first I would say it's nothing to be envious of because it's also a great responsibility because when you have the ability to interface with other realities, you also have more to do as a human. You have to convey messages in the right way. You have to take your existence into more consideration and act with higher codes of ethics. 
at least if you interface with the more, I would say, service to others beings. Because a lot of people who are, say, channels are really interfacing with the service to self. And they don't really know that they're interfacing with the service to self collectives. And that allows them to be more, I guess I would say, individualistic or self-determined in their life and to not really be tasked with higher pursuits. And some of these channels who um, claim to be channeling service to others, being like Arcturians or Pleiadians, say, are really not channeling those. They're channeling service to self-collectives who, for one reason or another, are lying about their identity to get others to believe them more and make their message more pronounced. So um, beyond that, I would say the best way to access these non-physical levels of reality is to learn who you are, to not lie to yourself, to figure out what you came here to do, to follow your intuition. And once you have become an integrated being, or once you are somewhat whole, you can then step beyond your individuality and beyond your personhood to explore what these other realms are and what they have to do with you. So it's a really, really long process, and I can't really give any suggestion from how to get from A to B because there's just so many steps along the way. Well, maybe in due time, uh, there'll be uh, better ways for for you to give advice, and you'll learn more things that'll help with that. But hey, if you, if you don't feel that you want to give it out, then hey, that's your prerogative, and I respect that. I respect that fully. Um, we received a lot of training from non-physical beings, animal energies. Okay, let's talk about the. Uh, well, specifically, can you describe the non-physical beings? Let's do this one by one. First, the non-physical beings, then the animal energies, and then your higher self, because that's what it says here in the bio here. Uh, so these non-physical beings, uh, can you give us a little biography about them, who, what, and what they are, where they come from, when they come from, if they're time travelers, and, and all the rest of it? They mostly don't give me names. Um, I don't think they want to be known for who they are. They care more about what they can do to help me, what they can do to help humanity. They are mostly higher dimensional beings. Um, most of them are somewhat physical and somewhat non-physical as well. And they are definitely not from this planet. They're not from anywhere nearby, but I don't know exactly what um, solar system or planet they are from. Um, I have a lot of female beings connected to me for some reason. And my interactions with them mostly consist of them transmitting some kind of inspiration or wisdom or knowledge to me. Sometimes they will channel specific kinds of music through me that allow me to see their worlds in different ways. It's never through language. It is always through kind of emotion or higher inspiration or direct perception that they communicate with me. Okay, and the specific um, <clears throat> animal energy, well, also, are there any plant energies, by the way, or is it just uh, animals and uh, what kind of uh, animals? Yeah, no plant energies that I'm specifically connected to, besides maybe trees. As far as animals, I sometimes shapeshift into them. Um, there's a snake, wolf, um, different kinds of cats. And when I do this, I, how would I say, it's almost the opposite of connecting with these higher dimensional non-physical entities in that shamans talk of the upper world and the lower world. So shape-shifting into these animal beings is more of going into the lower world. So it's not going into a more evolved version of myself but it's going into my animal instincts and a certain kind of emotional nature that is more primal than, say, just human or sentimental. 
and becoming an animal. It depends on the animal, but it teaches me about how to be strong or powerful, how to see past people's masks. Um, a lot of it is to do with being playful and really spontaneous in a way that people have almost completely forgotten today. Just how to enjoy your own presence, how to enjoy nature, and how to play with others. Oh, okay, so you shape shift into these uh, these little critters. Uh, okay, a lot of people can <laughs> ask. Okay, how do you, what do you mean by uh, by by shape shift? Because there's a lot of confusion about uh, what shape shifting is, what shape shifting isn't. Um, uh, I mean, there's the whole uh, David Icke analogy of. Uh, a human to into a giant reptile after they drink human blood and is it's like what you expect it to look like well some say no 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 that's not really how it works it's actually um your your third eye pineal gland is just getting a different view of the creature that's alleged to have shape shifted it really hasn't transformed from a reptile into a into a human and vice versa it's uh, j just the way your third eye perceives it uh, but then again there's other tales about how shape shifting works is it a third dimensional entity putting a hologram over itself or is it actually just taking uh hijacking the uh, chakra system and uh controlling an empty vessel with no soul through the uh through that and uh, i don't know but maybe you can help uh is this completely different from the like uh the reptile human shape-shifting phenomenon or um how de define shape-shifting i guess is the best first of all that's the best question to ask and the, how do you do it a real interesting point to bring up, and there are different kinds of shape shifting that humans can do. I know that some people can shape shift so that others see them literally change forms into an animal, but I don't know how to do that kind of shape shifting. It's very advanced, and either um, people who have certain types of DNA who are very connected to reptilians or reptilian hybrids can do that, or um, people who are very advanced down the shamanic path. But as far as I know, the majority of people who shapeshift merely are taking on the animal's astral or etheric body and merging with it on that level. So others' perceptions of you might change if they have some kind of intuition and can see beyond the physical form. But mostly shape-shifting just involves an interior change of perception and the change in your own experience of yourself, in your own experience of your physical senses. And animals um, perceive the physical world in a very different way than us and just a different form of knowledge that you have access to, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And... Uh... Also, your your higher self. Now, when we talk about higher self, is it just a self or selves? Would it make more sense to make the uh, the word self plural? Because there is not just one higher self. Some have uh, asserted, and if there are multiple um, higher selves of one given human being that's in 3D, um, I mean, what dimensions or densities are we talking about here in regards to um, the different uh, self or selves that are above you in terms of le levels of consciousness and um i would presume the harder in consciousness you get up with each higher self the harder it would be for the 3d human to communicate with it um, or maybe there's exceptions i don't know so uh, um what are we talking about here when we talk about higher self or selves how many what is it and how do you communicate with it i think different people have different numbers of higher selves that they communicate with and yes i think it is more accurate to say higher selves than the higher the people do sometimes have a point when they refer to higher self, that the higher self is the singular most evolved self that they connect to. In my experience, it is a collection of cells that are attached to different timelines or dimensions, and many of them belong to different races of beings. And... I guess there is a kind of collective consciousness or collective intelligence between them where they know how to interface in a way that is for their good and for my good, but to say what dimension or what density specifically they belong to is something that's far beyond my grasp. 
Okay, that's uh, that's all right. Um, your worldview is always evolving, but has most recently been informed by researchers such as Simon Parks, Tom Montauk, and Wes Penray. Okay, Montauk I had as a guest on my show. Penray mm-hmm. I tried to get, but I couldn't get him on. And Simon Parks, so that's a cool, crazy story in of itself. Uh, not going to get into that, but I, I I guess there's significance behind you choosing these um, three individuals. If you have to choose names, you chose these guys. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll talk about what is it in their research that you think is uh, worth uh, – regurgitating for the sake of enlightening humanity. Okay. Um, first of all, starting with Simon Parks, uh, some debate about whether he's legit or not. I mean, if he's uh, truly contacting um, both uh, benevolent and malevolent entities, you got to put an asterisk or a question mark on some of the things he says, because uh, if you can't really determine if they are um, malevolent uh, mantid beings, then, um, well, then there's some question marks. You're going to throw at that, of course, like I said, and a Lily Earthling uh, alleges to have, uh, debunks some of the things uh, Simon Parks talks about, and she asserts he couldn't have uh, possibly gotten to such a high political position that he was in if he truly was being legitimate. But I, I beg to differ on that. I, I can understand how he could have uh, done that and all, but uh, Lily Earthling's got issues in and of herself. But, uh, um, well, so I guess we'll take this one by one. Uh, first of all, Simon Parks, what, what have you learned from him that you feel is worth educating others about? What he talks a lot about is um, the origin of the soul and the specific races and beings that one comes from. So he is able to see into people to say, okay, this person has a mantis soul, this person has a reptilian soul, this person has a higher human soul. And the way he describes it, he says he's a conglomerate of three different soul parts. And these parts have all informed him in a certain way, and presumably he wouldn't be who he is without um, that specific constitution. He also says that it's not really that important if the beings that compose you are service to self or if they're service to others' entities. What is more important is where they are going and what your intentions are. So... When you say he's communicating with mantids who are presumably um, service to self, some might be malevolent. If he has enough awareness in his approach, he will only be communicating with those who want to help humanity since his intentions are to help humanity. And he would therefore draw in those beings who resonate with him. Okay, moving down the list, uh, Tom Montauk, uh, that was a, a great interview that I did with him way back in the day. A lot of people uh, seemed to love it, and he even uh, contacted me after the show to say, uh, loved having you as a as someone to guide an interview uh, with me. You uh, made things very interesting in the interview. So, uh, all right, I'm not here to glorify myself. I want you to have some glory and glorify Tom Montauk right now to explain why you chose him as someone to, to look up to and uh, give his name on your on your bio of all places. What is it about him and his research that you uh, want people to know? Well, I read a lot of his material a couple of years ago, back when I was understanding the different realities and how they interface with them. He talks a lot about um, service to others beings versus service to self beings and how to put yourself in alignment with one versus the other. And basically by giving in to fear or self-doubt or any of those kind of emotions, you draw yourself closer to the service to self-beings and by being open to wisdom and faith and trust in these higher emotions, you open yourself to the service to others beings. So at that time in my development, that was very instrumental. He also talks about reality creation and how it works on a higher level, basically going all the way from the higher dimensional selves of who we are, the higher dimensional other entities that are interacting with this world and how to kind of understand the conglomerate or the matrix of that and use that from your 3D understanding to influence what you are creating in the world every day. I find the way he portrays that to be very um, nuanced and those theoretically interesting and practically helpful. Okay, and uh, 
Last but not least, uh, Wes Penray. Uh, I've seen uh, his name around a few times. Uh, I think it was in a uh, Tolik round, and Drama Council contact the Tolik roundtable discussion was the last time I heard about him. So, why do you feel he is worth glorifying in your by name in your bio? I haven't found anyone yet whose research is as extensive as his in terms of going back millions of years to both the history of this planet, the history of other solar systems and planets that we are intertwined with, and all of the, I guess, beings who currently control our planet and exist on our planet. The way he draws all of these um, timelines together, the way he explains their generation, the way he explains where we are moving forward as a human collective is very interesting. There's a lot more density in his explanations than in many others. And he doesn't really take sides. He doesn't say, oh, we are a human race that are fighting against evil reptilians, for instance. He explains how some of the Anunnaki are benevolent, how some are malevolent, and how even the beings that we are fighting against, how some of them are the future selves of us. So it explains the picture, I would say, of potentials for our evolution in much, much more nuance than other researchers. Right, right. And uh, looking at the... uh... Last thing here in your bio here, uh, you are credentialed as a certified hypnotherapist, and I'd like to talk about mm-hmm. how you do this and um, what exactly um, day in the life of a, a hypnotherapist, well, day, uh, day in the job of a, of a hypnotherapist in regards to uh, how do you hypnotize people? This is a question I, I, I can't help but, but ask and try to seek yeah. answers to for the simple fact that I still remember how... Um, my uh, senior year of high school post prom party, there was a hypnotist there, and I was the first one. He had to kick off stage because he couldn't hypnotize out of my entire class. Okay, I don't know what the what what that's supposed to signify, but I'm thinking, okay, maybe that's a completely different type of hypnosis than the hypnotherapy that that you do. A stage hypnotist who has to kick people off stage if he uh, um, can't hypnotize them. It works on a completely different set of protocols and functions as. Uh, a hypnotherapist. Interesting thing, though, this hypnotist, he said, come on stage with the mentality that you want to be hypnotized. Uh, there was another hypnotist I saw named Tom DeLuca at a Penn State summer study program. I was at uh, summer of 2003 where um, he did not have to ask the people coming on stage um, did they come up here with the mentality that you want to be hypnotized. Uh, I mean, he still did kick, kick people off stage if he couldn't hypnotize them, but uh, um, he there were people there that were did get want to get hypnotized and did they want to try to resist getting hypnotized? I don't know, but uh, it's interesting how he didn't have to ask, uh, come up here with the mentality they want to be hypnotized. Now, do you have to do that when you're um, a hypno- as a hypnotherapist uh, to your clients to tell them if you don't go along and help try to help me here, it's not gonna not gonna work out? Um, and uh, well, what exactly do you seek to recover from in regards to information that you seek to recover from the clients that you that undergo hypnotherapy with you? Could you enlighten us on that, please? Well, there's a kind of hypnotism you can do to people that is beneath their conscious awareness, but unfortunately can't really do that with clients who are coming in for hypnotherapy because they know entirely what they are expecting. So the way that you change the reality is not really by subterfuge, it's entirely through their consent. And it is more methodical, say, than um, being a stage hypnotist. Uh, the way I bring people into other realities is usually just by guiding them into some kind of meditation, making them feel comfortable with themselves, then going down. Usually it's always the imagery, the symbolism is about going downward that helps people the most into their unconscious or whatever world they want to explore. So it's really helpful to do hypnotherapy for people who, say, have been abducted or who have ET experiences and are suppressing those or who have like other painful or traumatic experiences, they block out of their conscious awareness because 
if they trust you as an observer, they will be able to unlock those parts of themselves when they are in the right state. Uh huh. And uh, when you want to try to get this information from these people after hypnotizing them, uh, does this um, work because the 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 brain, or more specifically the subconscious mind, um, can uh, remember everything that happens to someone, regardless of even if the aliens that abducted them tried to try to do some sort of a memory block or, or a time blockage or something like that on them. Um, th there's no way they can, those aliens can overpower the, uh, the um, ability to recall of the, of the subconscious mind, which will naturally remember everything. Is that basically how that, how this works that on that, on that function, on that philosophy, on that ideology? I think it depends on the specific alien species that abducted somebody, I wouldn't say that the human subconscious is more powerful than any conceivable race of beings, but in most cases, people will be able to remember things that have been blocked out or that others have tried to suppress. All right, that's, uh, that's pretty good to know. Uh, so now, I guess... Uh, Looking at your uh, services page on your site, give you the chance to make a little bit of a sales pitch out of your work. Um, alchemical hypnotherapy. Well, we were just talking about uh, a hypnotherapy, but you use the term alchemical. Now, um, in regards to what the term alchemical means, uh, I had Jay Widener on my show, and he um, asserted that the best way to describe alchemy is, uh, well, the basic stereotype of turn worthless metals into gold. Well, what what's that based on? Well, the idea of the main idea behind alchemy that that idea of turning uh, metals into gold is uh, based on is that everything at the core essence of the nature of the universe is comprised of the same thing, consciousness, um, or in string theorists would say little tiny strings. String theory is generally accurate. That's what some of the word on the street is among those in the higher level conscious community. Uh, there are some blips, but in general, string theory is right. String theory is right. But, but anyhow, um, the alchemy idea, everything is at its core essence is uh, uh, the same thing. Therefore, if you um, keep believing and keep trying to harness the, 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 the fact that everything is the same, then you can by... Uh, the sheer probability uh, exercise and experiment a hundred zillion trillion times and you'll eventually get a result that doesn't make any sense or is not supposed to happen according to what uh, what the um, general nature of science says. Now Einstein would say that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting the same result when you don't get it is insanity but uh, I think that's something like how the quote went but an alchemist would say well no Einstein's is failing to take into account uh, how alchemy, um, real, what's really, really based on, and that anything is possible because everything is the same thing, I, I guess. I mean, I, it's interesting Einstein wouldn't know that because uh, I also remember Jay Winder saying on some History Channel program, uh, Einstein's wife said that before going to bed, he would Einstein would read books on alchemy, so you would expect he would know that if you keep trying the same thing and expect the same result, but you may eventually get a different result because that's what alchemy, alchemy shows, but... I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of digressing here. Uh, so what, is, what what do you see alchemy as, and why did you decide to put the word alchemical before hypnotherapy? Well, the real reason I have it there is the school of hypnotherapy. I learned from called the alchemical hypnotherapy. The reason they call it that is because you're basically transforming negative emotions into positive ones, to going into emotional trauma to find resolution and specific gifts or tools within that very traumatic event. And I would say there are different kinds or forms of alchemy. When you're dealing with the unconscious and emotions, it's usually a lower form of alchemy. When you have attained some degree of wholeness with yourself, you can then go towards a higher form of alchemy where you are transforming yourself or your lower human nature into a higher spiritual or etheric nature and some would say that is building a light body some would say that is becoming a higher self some would say that is transforming the um, carbon body that is the physical body into the crystalline body or the energy or the light body 
Um, there are many different interpretations, and I think that's because there is not one kind of alchemy. There is not one thing that all of the ancient philosophers are referring to. I believe there are different processes as there are different kinds of souls, and there are different ends towards which these souls can evolve. And basically, the only way to explain these higher natures or higher transformations is through all this poetic metaphor that they gave. The only way that really makes sense. Well, thank you very much. Um, and also, uh, to try to build, this is what one of the uh, little dots here uh, says uh, next to, under alchemical the therapy title, uh, assist you in a building relationship with spirit guides, contact the ancestors and your higher self, and healing trauma from this and past incarnations. Uh, take this bit by bit here. First of all, the, the spirit guides. Um, it's often said, uh, ask your spirit guides and guardian angels for help. Oh, okay, well, right there, there seems to be a differentiation between uh, spirit guides and guardian angels or archangels. They're not exactly the one and the same. They, they, if you want to try to categorize things by certain characteristics, then uh, then angels would not go in the same category of spirit guides. Well, what would go into uh, the category of spirit guides? How do you describe the, the different entities, if that's the right word, um, that could fit in the category of spirit guides? Um, first off, I wouldn't consider archangels or guardian angels to be spirit guides. A lot of them are malevolent beings who are disguising themselves as good because they want to control the reality of others. They're basically archons who come to these people after they die and tell them that they have done wrong in this life and that in order to follow the light, they need to come back and change something. So just using the word angels, the way that people relate to this is often um, damaging and doesn't direct them towards this force of goodness that really is trying to help them. In my perception, I would call spirit guide any being that is around a person who is generally benevolent and helping them through their life and through their evolution. And these spirit guides can take many different forms and different people. Um, some can be familiars, some can be animal spirits, um, some can be individuals who were once incarnated as humans and have since evolved, and others can be beings who have never even resided on planet Earth. Thank you. In regards to uh, contacting, we already talked about contacting the uh, higher self and such, but contacting um, ancestors, um, well, this raises a can of work. Like, how would you uh, contact someone who uh, doesn't really have um, as close a, a bloodline connection in regards to being uh, genetically related to you? Like, uh, one would think uh, ancestor who was a first cousin of yours would be easier to to contact a second cousin or any other cousin beyond the first that was an ancestor simply because the the blood relation is is closer so um but then again maybe there's uh there are some exceptions to that <laughs> and that's where you come in to explain this so when you're contacting ancestors how easy or difficult is it to contact certain ancestors of different bloodline relations to you and uh, are there any specific ancestors that you would recommend uh contacting more than than other types of ancestors like uh, i guess it'll make more sense to want to contact your grandfather rather than your third cousin but all right what do you have to say about this mm, i wouldn't say it's necessarily more difficult to contact an ancestor that is more incarnations removed it depends on how your consciousness is configured and how well you are connected to etheric and astral levels of reality. If you're primarily connected to physical reality, it's probably easier for you to connect with people who are closer in bloodline, but that's not necessarily the case. And as far as which ancestors are best to connect with, again, it, determines, it is determined by your purpose for connecting to them. Sometimes, um, one connects to ancestors in order to resolve some kind of past trauma. If this ancestor, say, had an experience that is still affecting the way you perceive reality, which happens with nearly everybody, basically working with the ancestors helps get deeper at the roots of how you perceive reality 
and any um, unhealed issue that is within you. But then there's another way of connecting with ancestors that is more shamanic that I wouldn't necessarily recommend for anyone who is not following a spiritual path, but that is to connect to the ancestors who have specific gifts that they can use to empower your life. So say you are learning spiritual work, there are probably ancestors from a few generations past, maybe even a dozen generations past, who were druids or witches or shamans, and connecting to them and remembering pieces of their life, connecting with their energy and their gifts will um, bring you more into yourself and connect you to your spiritual bloodline in a way. Thank you very much. And in regards to last thing on the bullet here, healing trauma from this and past incarnations. Now, um, <clears throat> healing uh, something from the past, little experience there. I can sort of relate to that about how I was getting pain in the middle of my uh, right quadricep uh, for a period of time. Didn't exactly know what, what it was or had to, went to see some doctors. They couldn't find anything wrong with it. And then I found out from channeling some guy at a in 5d conference that i went to um that this guy i think his name was eric he's on the other side he committed suicide and now to resolve the karma that he created by committing suicide that he's gonna try to help people in this reality heal so um he channels through some lady and uh this lady who i asked the question to for eric uh about why is my thigh in pain she um said uh past life incarnation uh coming back to haunt you something to uh, to that effect although it, it's interesting i have heard some people say a past life pain will will usually happen on the left side of your body well i was an exception to that in regards to this pain on my right um leg so could you perhaps explain why i had an exception to the rule in that regard in regards to what side of my body a past life trauma incarnation would, would um would happen and um well um uh, is uh uh trauma from this present time any more or less important than healing trauma from a past incarnation or would you say they're equally important just a side question there okay so with your first question i'm not entirely sure how physical pain from a past life affects you in this individual life it doesn't seem like there's as precise a mapping for that as there is say from emotional pain or relational pain which affects you in a more immediate way Usually in a past life, if you experience a trauma that, say, affects your energy body in a specific area, say a heart trauma, it will still affect the energy in your heart. If you experience something in your throat, it will still affect your throat in your current life. Um, as far as your next question... Um, yeah, is uh, past life any more or less important than this present life, healing it? Oh, um, the thing is, you can't get energy back from your past life. The energy that you collect is from your present incarnation. The way that souls incarnate all of your energy is specifically here in this incarnation, but your memories are not in this incarnation, and your experiences are basically all spread out through time. The way I understand it is basically you have a higher dimensional self, and the only way that it can incarnate in a 3D world is if it splits into many different parts, and these parts are basically your past lives all the way through to your present life. And depending on how many dimensions you are in your higher self that will determine the way that you incarnate here in the physical realm. But basically past lives are not really past lives. They just seem like they are past because of the way that we perceive time as human beings. But once you break out of the idea that they are past and you realize that they are currently happening, you realize how the way that these other selves are interacting with reality, the kinds of emotions they experience and the way they relate to the world is influencing who you are today. So it's more complex than saying that you have to, say, focus on healing your current life or your past lives. You have to work on both 
but in different ways. Um, the more impactful way is working on your energy from your current life, but in your past life, working on your emotions or different residual issues. And as you do that, there's basically this um, ping back effect between your past lives and your present life. The more you work on your past lives, the more it changes your present life. And then from this different um, vantage point in your present life, you can continue to change your past lives until you get to a place where they are all kind of in a state of harmony and all brought into the unity of the consciousness of your higher self. Also, uh, going down to the third bullet here, as a collective, we've expanded in this practice and specialize in a past life, a second finger past life, and between lives regression. Okay, between lives. That's a, that's a new concept that I am not at all familiar with, so I'm interested to see what you have to say about this. Where are you making the uh, assertion that we have um, between lives, as a life between a life, if that makes sense, if that's what it is? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, This has been documented in cases by different researchers who specifically have done studies where they take people into a state where they ask them to recall what has gone on between their lives, and they very often say similar things. Um, The conclusion that these researchers have come to is that there is a specific way in which the soul incarnates in a physical body. There is a way that the soul leaves the body when the body dies and um, a process that these souls go through where they see the light, where they interact with their spirit guides, they go through some kind of tunnel and after that they return to the earth. So basically you can do a between lives regression on someone for them to maybe understand what kind of entities will communicate with them that were not benevolent, that were having them experience things in this life because these entities, they convinced them that they needed to experience pain or suffering to atone for something in a past life. So through this between lives regression, you can come to the contracts that the soul made with specific entities. You can see the contract and you can undo them if they are not serving the soul in this current incarnation. Thank you. And uh, it says here, we are currently developing our expertise in the following uh, modalities. Well, first of all, good luck on improving your expertise, but let's go through these uh, bit by bit here. Uh, first of all, implant removal. Okay, there's, this seems to be a, one of the most popularized topics in the in the world today, not by the mainstream media, but definitely in the uh, alternative community. And uh, what kind of implants are we talking about here, um, and how do you remove them? These are implants of an etheric nature. Um, They are usually placed in the human energy body by malevolent beings who are trying to control them. They are most commonly reptilians, um, gray aliens, or archons, although they can be from a different race. And there are different ways to remove them. One of them is by increasing the um, vibratory rate of the energy body to the degree where it basically can't hold the lower frequency of the implants. The implants are almost always lower frequency. And if you raise the frequency of the energy body enough, you basically shatter some of the implants. Um, There are other ways where you can say, if you see the implant physically in the client's body, you can put your hand on it and use your hand to draw it out or to dissolve it. Um, Different um, healers and practitioners basically use different techniques that they feel attuned to and still trying to figure out which technique works best and is most effective for me. Like I said, good luck with that. Um, Okay, uh, spirit uh, depossession. Now, a uh, couple of things I want to um, say about this before I give you the chance to talk about how, uh, what kind of spirits we're talking about here and how you depossess people of them. But uh, first of all, um, a couple of people that I've had experiences with who seem to be um, suffering from this unfortunate thing, my 
a neighbor is a uh, is a Christian uh, pastor, a reverend, and um, of the Swedenborgian Christian faith. I live in Bernathan, and uh, he works on the Bernathan Low Moreland border, actually, and he's a uh, part of the member of the Bernathan Cathedral, and uh, he unfortunately has this problem. Uh, Daniel Teague of Vegas Star Healings found out about it. Um, I told him about the uh, uh, Bernathan Cathedral, Daniel, and he actually got into conversation about cha- uh, checking my uh, my neighbor who's a minister, and I told, and he scanned uh, the chakra system of my neighbor, and um, he found that all seven of his chakras are energetically blocked. And uh, he found out the reason for that is because a parasitic entity had hijacked his aura system. And to make matters worse, this aura, this um, entity can court other people um, when he gives Christian sermons. And um, this seems to be another problem that eventually uh, that ended up uh, getting me banned, unfortunately, from some spirituality place that I just wanted to help. This place I wanted to start going to regularly, uh, uh, spirituality uh uh, place in Philly, in nor- 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 northeast Philly. Um, they, uh, uh, I decided to ask Daniel T to clear the negative energies out of that place, and I paid him 150 bucks for that. And I told the person um, through a Facebook message, "Hey, I'm happy to report there's no negative energies at your place anymore. Um, I ho- hope this benefits you." And the only thing that the head of that place did to reward me for that was say, you are officially banned from ever coming here. What you did is a violation of uh, spirit and love and, and all that because we're all one, including negative energies and removing the negative energies. I, I don't approve of that, so you're banned for all eternity. I'm like, my God, how could people be so stupid? And I asked Daniel Teague, okay, uh, so what the hell is this person's problem? How could they possibly treat me like this when I just did them a huge favor and took 150 bucks out of my pocket to do it? Well, he found that this person who runs a place has the exact same problem as my neighbor. Seven shock is uh, energetically blocked by a parasitic entity that's hijacked the aura and can court other people. So, <laughs> well, I may have thrown a big monkey wrench into the bad entities' uh, plans by clearing out the negative energies, but unfortunately, as long as people go there, they're at risk of being courted by that lady. And, uh, well, maybe it's a good thing she banned me. <laughs> so, um, but th- th- maybe you're familiar with uh, with this kind of a phenomenon of people who, um, even people that seem strictly nice, benevolent in every way, like my, my neighbor, all seven chakras are blocked because an entity has hijacked their aura that cord that can court other people. Are you familiar with this? Do you um, can you possibly do anything to help people that go through that? And also, what kinds of sp- other spirits and what kind? What are your methods for? What's the procedure for depossessing people, if you will? Well, what you describe is really dramatic. It doesn't always play out like that in actual reality. It's not always as theatrical per se. Um, I. I do experience that a lot of people are affected by um, going to church or other spiritual or religious places because that is basically a kind of magical ritual where you are agreeing or submitting to having something higher control your energy in whatever way that it wants to. Um, The way to get out of these kinds of agreements or to sever someone's energy from these entities is varied. It depends on how they got them in the first place. Sometimes you have to go back to a certain contract that they made with them and make them revoke this contract. Um, There are many different kinds of entities, and these entities are best removed in different ways. Say, If you are working with the demonic entity, it's not really safe to try to take it out yourself because there's a risk that this entity will come or lash onto you. And in that case, it's better to work with the guides that a person has than to say, work with your own power. There are a lot of lesser entities, I would say. People are most often um, not really possessed because possessed is too strong of a word and that describes something that just happens in a small number of cases. Usually it's an entity that is kind of um, circling around someone's aura or on the edge of their awareness and they most often have these entity afflictions with um, different lower entities. So say ghosts or other disembodied spirits that are just kind of wandering around that are from either this dimension or between the third and the fourth dimension that are just kind of clinging to people because they have energetic openings and they don't really know better. 
So in these cases, these are, these are the easiest kinds of entities to remove. You can just communicate with them directly. And since they're not like higher dimensional, specifically malevolent beings, you can just use a compassionate way of telling them that you see that they are suffering. You don't want them to suffer. You offer them healing and they agree to be healed and go back to where they are and stop bothering the person that they are latched onto. And the specific kind of depossession is called compassionate depossession. And a lot of kind of new age shamans today use that. And it is effective, but it only works with these like kinds of entities that are not really that powerful. For the more powerful entities, sometimes you have to just employ any kind of means that you know to get rid of them or any kind of different magic, basically whatever is in your toolkit. And it's, of course, it's always in your best interest to try to keep adding tools to, to that toolkit for the better. Um, and last thing here on the bullet currently developing expertise in the following modalities uh healing trauma caused by mind control <clears throat> oh well i'm also interested if you could heal mind control caused by trauma because uh mm -hmm. one of the more common trying types of mind control is a uh, trauma-based mind control i'm pretty sure that's what we actually witnessed uh all the football fans out in the world who were expecting uh to have the Philadelphia Eagles play the New Orleans Saints, but at the last second, that Saints defensive back totally blew it, and Vikings scored a game-winning touchdown. Uh, Fritz Springmeier, I interviewed him. He said NFL players and coaches under trauma-based mind control, which can cause them to do ridiculous things like uh, miss tackles that could easily have been made, like that Saints defensive back did. And I'm wondering if he and all the other football players and all the other hockey players out there, it's very prominent in hockey too, that can certainly explain how they can get the players to fight with each other spontaneously. It's all about the mind control caused by... Uh, trauma-based mind control, putting a bag over your head and pulverizing you or whatever other method by which they do that. Um, these people, maybe they could possibly get the get help from you so um, this doesn't haunt them or affect the outcome of a game in this sense. Um, but anyhow, um, uh, you wrote healing trauma caused by mind control. So, mm -hmm. well, uh, can you also, like I said, heal mind control caused by trauma, or maybe are they one and the same? And uh, what kind of mind control here are we uh, are we talking about? There's different kinds of uh, mind control. I just gave one with the bag over the head and pulverizing the guy, but there's more than that. So, well, I would say the two cases you referred to aren't really the same. Um, what um, putting a bag over someone's head does it doesn't really um change the structure of their psyche on a significant level. It just creates one traumatic event and healing that traumatic event basically will put them back to the norm. But in cases where people are say taken by different MK older projects at a very young age, their psyches are almost completely altered and some parts of them are shattered or obliterated. And they basically end up forming these different altars or identities. Their core self dissociates. And they form two or three or four or five um, different personalities or selves. So you basically have to work through a state of hypnotic regression into the different cells to get them all to come to the forefront and heal them on an individual level until they are whole enough to begin to work together. Um, I don't really know of any systematic approach to healing um, that kind of mind control because it changes somebody on such a deep level that it often takes years to put them back to their um, original state. They often don't even remember who they are and you have to completely form a new self for them, a new core self, and that takes a lot of time. Yeah, these people, they could be uh, being a nice benevolent Christian minister in a church and then when the mind control is Activated, they could be, be a, they could be a satanic preacher in a cult. <laughs> That's one example that I didn't just make that up. Uh, there was a 
Uh, Jay Parker uh, talked about some guy that he knew I, that was like that who was uh, could not understand how is it that I was giving Christian uh, excuse me satanic uh, a sermon at a at a cult and not know it when I was giving a Christian talk uh, at, a, at a church on Sundays and well because it was all in the mind control all in the honeycombs in the brain so well, that's how it is unfortunately with, with some people so but anyhow let's move on to a more positive thing here <laughs> lifestyle coaching. Um, the thing about coaching um, that I uh, could never understand when I first looked into this, um, like a coach, life coach is not supposed to give advice. That's so counterintuitive to me. I, After I graduated high school, I actually decided uh, in my first year of college, just to, in my spare time when I could go back to the to the high school to a coach, uh, volunteered and get paid, uh, just coach the track team in the shot put and discus um, area. And... Uh, because I was pretty good at that, thought uh, I could uh, improve my my overall self by being a coach in that regard, and I remember giving advice to the athletes all the time. <laughs> so to hear me hear that a lifestyle coach does not give advice is a uh, sign of sort of counterintuitive. So maybe you could help uh, me make sense of that, and um, well then we'll, we'll just go from there. How do you lifestyle coach people? Well, not giving advice to people sounds a little bit counterintuitive to me as well. It's a kind of new age approach. It's that everybody is their own teacher. Everybody is their own guru. And to some degree, that is a good perspective to keep in mind for humility. Um, you have to know that you ultimately can't determine another person's trajectory. It has to be by their conscious choice and by their free will. And if you try to make a person um, more in line with their higher self or with their guidance, it's obviously going to work better than if you just give them your advice from your perspective and project your own opinions onto them. But ultimately, what it comes down to is the idea of never giving people advice, just asking them questions or passively guiding them is a bit too feminine for many people. A lot of people just need to be told bluntly what they need to do. They need direct and concrete advice from you, and they will appreciate that kind of advice a lot. And this direct approach often takes them closer to their truth than just um, inquiring within themselves. You basically have to understand what perspective your client is coming from what kind of approach they need and will benefit them the most. Thank you. And in regards to a holistic lifestyle and nutrition guidance, the last bullet here uh, says a suggestions for where to live, who to associate with, what to eat, and most align with yourself. Now, uh, specifically, uh, where you should live. Um, now, do you um, uh, have any astro location um, advice to, to give? Many would say that if you want to teach people uh, where the best uh, – best place to be if location 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 it's all about location really is true well then you, you can't do any better than um using the stars to not just map your life but map where you should be at given times and uh there are guides out there that use astro location so uh do you in any way do that and if uh not would you perhaps be willing to consider using it now that i brought that to your attention and um well let, let's do that let's go one by one here so suggestions where you should live astro location or not I'm actually not very familiar with that message. For what I do, it's usually a divination. There's never one best location. There's usually not one best location. It's usually a location that has frequencies that are close enough to what the person needs or wants in their life. Fair enough. And who you should... Uh associate with well one who could argue that what you will well it's obviously a fact it's not an argument it's a fact what you uh by virtue of the fact that we're infinite consciousness and reality is holographic what you um give out is what you will get so uh, naturally uh i think the proper way to look at this is it's not really uh, helping you make sense of who you should associate with it's uh what kind of people come to you if you act a certain way because if you act in good ways, you'll only get good people come at you that you would uh, associate with. Or is there more to the story than than the way I'm describing it there? Do you, can you give other advice other than, well, behave yourself and people who can behave themselves will come to you? So is there more to it than just that? 
Um, I would say the law of attraction is more complex than that. Just because you're a good person doesn't mean that only good person good people will gravitate to you. A lot of bad people will try to interfere with you if you're a good person because these bad people will be controlled by higher entities that want to basically mess around with the agendas of people who are good and ethical in the world today. Um, but in general, I would say by aligning yourself as much as you can with your true self, you will attract the right people or the people that are closest to the ones that you can potentially get within your inner circle. But a lot of what I am intending within this is um, not so much of a positive approach, but a negative approach. So showing people how others in their lives are not really serving them, how they're not bringing them closer to what they're supposed to do, how they are not helping them emotionally or in any other way. Thank you. And um, what you should eat and uh, to be most aligned with yourself. All right. Well, there's a lot of people <clears throat> that will naturally ag flat out agree to disagree on what you should eat. And for the, there are those that really take it to an extreme and would say everybody should be a vegan no questions asked uh, no animal products in you at all because humans are not supposed to be doing that we were conditioned to do that so it only makes sense to to say be vacant well there are so many people who try veganism and it flat out doesn't work and uh i mean are we really supposed to be herbivores as all the spiritual people uh i don't mean to sound stereotypical but it seems mostly in the spiritual community where people uh, will um assert that this is the key to high spirituality going vegan going vegan uh, no meat at all no no dairy products and and uh no eggs either and well uh, how can you take that stuff out of your your life easily and not have a few health problems to deal with i mean i, I myself actually lost a friend who decided to become strictly vegan because he became such a jerk after being a vegan i couldn't associate with him anymore <laughs> he didn't ditch me i ditched him so um i don't know if I'm sure there's other people who have um, problems like that with uh, people who turn vegan and become such assholes, but is it really because they're strict about being vegan or is it because the lack of uh, non-vegan nutrition kind of uh, warped their minds, if you will, and that's what makes them act like that. So, okay, what what, what advice can you give on what you should eat and uh, is it's not it can't possibly be one size fits all in regards to in regards to everybody in this regard. Well, since you mentioned it, I think that veganism today has become some kind of propaganda that's not really designed to make people healthier, but that's designed to make them weaker since animal products fill the body with strength and a certain kind of connection to vital energies that many people lack if they don't consume these things externally. There are some common guidelines that you can give people for what is good or not good to eat, say, and tell them not to eat GMOs, to eat organic food as much as possible, to not consume fluoride, um, to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. But beyond that, I don't think there is one specific diet that you can preach and that will help everybody. Basically, you need to figure out what this person needs at both a physical and an energetic level. And Ayurveda talks to some degree about this, saying that there are different kinds of people who have different energetic needs and therefore um, should eat different kinds of diets that provide them different kind of energy. And I think that's completely correct. And it takes a little bit of experimentation both for this person to find what makes them the strongest and to learn to eat in that way. There is a very um, intuitive mode of eating that you can teach to people that basically overrides all of their programming in this life for, okay, what do I like? What do my parents tell me to eat? What do my friends eat? And that just goes to the foods that make you stronger and more energetic. But this is something people have to learn over time, obviously. Because in many cases, people are completely detached from their body and detached from knowing what is best for them. Thank you for your advice on that. Um, okay. Uh, 
spiritual counseling and uh, mentorship going down the the things here. Um, so uh, let me look at the dots here. Uh, okay, let, let's do the last one here. Maybe we'll go back and something on the first, but I just I I, I popped here actualization of your spiritual path mm-hmm. with specific exercises, practices, and assistance in completing it. Okay, you write specific there, so you obviously think okay, there's um. Uh, it's easy to pinpoint whether a certain exercise is going to be good or bad for this specific person. So what specific characteristics are we talking about here when you uh, try to help someone pick out exercises and practices um, to get to their spiritual path? Well, it determines, it is um, important to determine what their level of development is and what kind of spirituality they're seeking to learn and for what reasons. So often I will prescribe a certain kind of meditation or something that will teach them to orient their awareness in a kind of way. But as far as people who are more advanced in their path, there are many different shamanic exercises that I teach about basically either using your awareness to see things beyond you, to cultivate, say, an astral double that can go into different places and perceive these realities in different places, or just using your awareness to see other people in their energy, to use your awareness to um, get a sense of different animal energies or different beings, basically... If you don't use specific practices, people often are overwhelmed by just the variety of experiences that they can have on a spiritual level. And it's like lifting weights. If you do certain amounts of repetitions of different specific movements of your awareness that you will build strength in those areas and you will eventually have a kind of vocabulary through these basic movements in order to be able to do things in a more spontaneous way. If you don't do exercises, it's like, I don't know, not playing scales on piano or something. You just can't get the fingering right when you want to improvise. Thank you very much. And uh, going down the list here, um, angelic healing. Um, Oh, there's a few things here I'd like to get into. Um, first of all, uh, distant uh, spirit uh, depossession. We well, we sort of talked about the whole idea of um, uh, of that when I mentioned about the uh, entities that my neighbor and some person who banned me from a, a spirituality place have with their high, a chakra system and an entity of their aura. But there's other types of entities. And um, when you're talking about an exorcism, like let's say you have to do, do a spontaneous exorcism when you, you notice that someone is possessed just out of the blue you you see someone's possessed you want to help them um at that exact moment um i mean it can be done i saw david ike do it once um at uh that uh, gateway to the gods um doorway that's um drawing a blank on what country in south america that uh or is it central america that that thing is in um and uh, he was there and some guy was possessed by an entity there and david ike uh get the F out, get the F out. He, he shouted as he was trying to exercise the like, human of the entity. And well, it apparently worked. And that was a, he had no planning to do that. He just uh, did it when, cause he saw the guy was in trouble and he wanted to help there. So um, it's obviously possible to do it spontaneously if you have to. So, I mean, any um, advice for people that need to do that? Can you possibly offer? Um, exorcism is not one of the things I do because it's kind of dangerous. Wow. Um, it is more of a black magical practice than anything shamanic. It often consists of um, using words or languages that have a high amount of power in relation to the entity, so basically scaring the entity away and telling it to never return. And in most cases, it's better to do the possession, which is a way of sort of healing the person and the entity more. I would say um, specific exorcism is best when you're dealing with demons or something that's like highly parasitical. But again, that's not something I specifically do. Okay. And uh, well, 
maybe you can help uh, people make up <clears throat> that have had problems with this make sense of it. Um, I mean, you, you've heard a lot of crazy stuff about uh, sexual harassment in the media nowadays, it seems, and people uh, are just flat out afraid. Oh my God, I don't know what to say because the slightest mistake of the tongue can get me sued and what am I going to do? And uh, uh, well, maybe you have the entities to blame and where am I getting that idea? Well, it, I it, during my Akashic um, Records reading session with Andrew Bartzis, um I was uh, remembering some a brief period of time when I was in high school when I um, spontaneously in the hallway seemed to be making uh, subject, uh, sexually inappropriate comments to girls who I had a little bit of a crush on. And I asked Andrew Bartz, this woman, Stanford, the law of attraction, what did uh, that girl do to deserve me to do that sexually inappropriate things to her? And he said, well, well to tell you the truth, uh, an entity had actually uh, possessed you at those times. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I didn't, I, there was nothing I remember from those experiences where that would lead me to think, okay, I'm, I just got possessed at this moment. And that's why I feel inclined to make a sexually inappropriate comment at some girl I have a crush on, but well, uh, he accessed the Akashic Records, so it must be true. Um, now <laughs> with the fear of being sued for sexual harassment seeming to be more prominent now, if it really is true that it will happen to someone because they've been possessed by an entity, um, is there any way you could give advice to people? Like if you don't want to be, uh, possessed by an entity that makes you uh, sexually harass people, here's my advice. How do you prevent entities from hijacking you like that? Oh my gosh, I don't think there's any blanket advice I can offer people for that besides just work on their own energy and their energy field, make themselves higher vibrational, try to repair, to seal any um, leaks or blocks that they have in their energy field. Obviously, I guess some of these entities are so scheming and sly that they can interfere with somebody who is even very aware and who works on their own energy. So there's not really anything that you can say that will prevent it in 100% of cases. Although I would say to not be afraid of entities possessing you because being afraid of that happening is probably the number one thing that will actually make it happen. Okay, that does make sense from a law of attraction standpoint. <laughs> Indeed. Okay, so, uh, well, anyhow, um, moving on here, uh, spiritual protection, okay, one, ways to protect yourself. We were just getting into this, but a couple of exercises I do that I learned this from Daniel Teague, uh, he uh, says, um, imagine yourself being enveloped in a Merkaba vessel and imagine um, a gold, uh, white, silver, um, and uh, uh, some other color. Is it, yeah, gold, whatever the four colors. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on the colors now. I never draw a blank when I do the exercise. But anyhow, um, he says, imagine those colors swirling around you as you're enveloped in the uh, Merkaba. And, uh, oh, yeah, it's gold, white, light, silver, and diamond. Okay, gold, white, light, silver, and diamond in that respective order. Those are the colors you imagine going around you. And um, then after you imagine that, you say no negativity is allowed to penetrate this space. I like to say that three times. Um, another exercise involves uh, putting, like, grids around you and all that. Uh, a little complicated to describe. Um, but anyhow, a uh, question I have about this is, okay, well, how long is this going to last? I mean, um, I do it once a day in the morning usually, but is there, should I maybe be doing it at three hour intervals perhaps? How would one know how long it's going to take for, um, for, uh, um, th th an exercise like this to last? Um, and, uh, also in regards to, um, and related note, angelic guidance and connection, like I'm currently in the process of doing Carrie Samuel's 28 days with the archangels thing and um, started it in early January. Felt like doing it between two moods and a blue moon is appropriate. <laughs> and um, well, uh, I I wonder, okay, uh, how long should I um, expect these a angels, their exercises to, to last on me? Because Carrie Samuel seems to hint, you should be doing these exercises at the beginning of the day and not, and not at night. But, Okay, well, if you do it at night, can it last do you only through the night, and then when you get up in the morning, you got to do it again, or it's not going to last on you? So how long is the question I mean to try and ask you for the spiritual exercise, like the in the Merkaba with the light swirling around you, and um, when you ask your angels and guides to protect you, well, how long can you expect before you got to ask them again before the protection wears off? 
Okay, and the first project that you described with the Merkaba doesn't seem like it is something that will be given by a benevolent being. It seems very ritualistic, and rituals usually are connected to dark entities. Um, the Anunnaki in ancient times gave humans a lot of magical rituals that they said they would need to do in order to have power, in order to be protected in certain circumstances. And they would say if they weren't completed in this specific way, they would fail. The reason that they did that is because it would cause people to have fear that they wouldn't do it correctly and kind of a superstition that these higher entities that were involved in the ritual could possibly hurt them. So basically anything that you feel when you are doing a magical practice is going to change the realities that are working with you. So anytime that you fear that you are not doing something correctly, say in the case of a ritual, you are more likely to call in negative beings. Um, the highest types of magic that I know of are incredibly spontaneous and they happen just in the moment through the connection to infinity. They don't come from any kind of higher being or specific procedure. They come from your own self and nothing really can be a replacement from your connection to your own self. Anytime that you say are doing a kind of practice that works with other beings, you are choosing to take their expertise or strength or power instead of your own, which makes you dependent on something outside of yourself. And ultimately, if you are trying to protect yourself and you believe that you have to protect yourself by calling on something else, that is because at some level you believe you are lacking or you are not strong enough in this belief that you are lacking something is exactly what is going to call in these entities that can hurt you in some way. Um, on another level, anything that is referred to as an angel or an archangel, I would be very wary of. I know a lot of archangels are just archons in disguise, and people say that's the reason that the first four letters of their name are spelled the same way. So basically, they are beings that proclaim that they are benevolent. They are um, evolved and intelligent enough to deceive you and to basically make you feel the sentiment of love around them. And if you don't question that, sentiment. You just say, okay, I'm feeling a positive thing, so these entities, these angels or whatever are helping me and are good, but these beings are very, very skilled at deceiving people through emotions because they know that people are not nearly as emotionally evolved as they are. So I would um, refrain from calling in any kind of angel because if you call in an angel, it's probably the true angels are not going to respond in that sense if you say, okay, come here, Archangel Michael or Archangel Raphael. They don't really want to be revered in that way. Well, where are you making that assertion? I've, I've raised this question up numerous times on, <laughs> on this show, and I, there, it seems like everybody says, okay, all that stuff about archangels are strictly malevolent because arc sounds like archon. No, 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 no. There are good angels out there, and they will help you. Um, to, so where are you making the assertion that the good angels don't want don't to help you? No, that's not what I was saying. I'm saying if you use a name to call upon them, you're much more likely to call in a malevolent being because if you use language, um, language was created by beings who are still controlling us, and by using language, you kind of tap into their vibration or their control structure. What you want to do is to get outside of language because in the domain of just pure sentiment, or will, or intention, you have power. You are no longer ruled by these outside scripts and names and letters and spells. And through your own intentions, through your own thoughts, and by asking for benevolent beings to help, you are more likely to connect with the benevolent beings who actually will help you. Um, I believe that there are angels, but the most don't want to be known by name 
and the way to connect with them or reach them is by loving yourself and having faith and trust in their existence and asking from a genuine place within yourself um, an uncorrupted and pure place for their help. And through this kind of psychic connection, you will find them and then they will work with you. But any kind of, say, magical incantation to call upon the angels is much more likely to be corrupt and it's possible that maybe a good being will hear this and crack into it to help you anyways, but they're not nearly as likely to find you if you try to interact with them in that way. Well, I don't know, because um, I remember Matt Kahn listening to one of his talks. He was telling people to repeat after him a mantra, and when he got to reciting something too long, um, saying something too long, and everybody in the crowd kind of forgot what he said when they were trying to repeat after him. Uh, this was near the end of the talk, and uh, and he was like, hey, don't worry, the universe knows what you're talking about. So, okay, if, well, if the universe, the higher consciousness universe, knows what you're talking about, you would expect that if you were to say, Archangel Michael, come to me now, the good, benevolent Archangel Michael knows what you mean, knows what you're talking about, and the fact that he knows what you're talking about because he accesses the true meaning, the true layout of your thoughts and what they are truly designed to mean, even if you're having a tough time, like, describing something, if you're, like, trying to, in a healing, uh, just tell, like, Archangel Michael how to heal you, and you're trying to be specific, you don't have to worry about being specific, because Archangel Michael, don't worry, he knows what you're talking about, he, he can read your thoughts, he can understand what, he knows what you want, so he knows what you're trying to ask for, even if you can't articulate it. And if that's the case, well, then there's really no reason to be concerned about uh, what you call the angels by or um, how you try to ask, give them instructions in regards to, to how to heal you. Uh, you got to ask still, but you don't have to worry, obsess about being concise and articulate because they they know what you mean, if that makes sense. So are you saying uh, that's not necessarily the case? Well, I'm saying if you presume that there is a being that is known by Archangel Michael and it's a benevolent being, then calling him by that name will likely make him see your presence and come to you, but it will also attract other beings who operate through language and through spells and don't have your best interest at heart. And since the universe is not primarily good, it's a mix of all kinds of intentions, you would then have a benevolent entity with you and one with negative intentions and it's uncertain which one would actually um, get more control of you by asking that. I'm saying not to worry about how you articulate certain things because fear is what will draw in any negative being, but just to speak from a genuine place not to worry and to trust that um, the beings that you are calling will come to you. Again, it's more important what you feel at a deep level of your being than what you say because um, language is three-dimensional. Um, feelings are connected to your higher self and they reach something that is higher dimensional. Wow. <laughs> This is a question I'd love to ask Carrie Samuels if I ever have her on again and see what her take on this, because in her instructions, she always says, just think or say out loud, and then she says, call the angel by name. Well, I mean, I'm sure she's saying, well, the angel knows you're talking about it, but talking about uh, other good, uh, bad angels masquerading as good angels, bringing them in just because you use the, the 3D English language. Wow, uh, I wonder what her thought on that would be, because that's a new concept. I haven't heard people assert that that's how it actually works, but... um. But by your reasoning behind why it may be like that does kind of does actually kind of make sense, and this does um, also seem to resonate with something else that uh, that Brad Johnson, who channels Adronus, was uh, talking about in one of his recent uh, webinars. He was talking about how the universe doesn't understand no, like you give out thoughts, I want this or I don't want this. The universe doesn't um, recognize that. Um, uh, it just, whether it's you want or don't want it, it's recognized as, well, this is the thought and this is the emotion behind the thought, not the emotion, not whether you do or don't want it, but the actual energetic, magnetic, feminine emo feminine energy emotion with the masculine energy being the thought. Um, you can, by, by, by that fact, the universe doesn't understand, no, um, attract things that you don't want. A classic example of this, I think, is something I've uh, experienced a couple times myself where I was uh, 
taping some Philadelphia Eagles games because it was a nice day. I wanted to enjoy nature, but I also wanted to watch the Eagles and definitely want to watch them now because they're on the verge of being the Super Bowl, but that's beside the point. Anyhow, well, so are the Patriots. I'm from Boston. I'm sure you've heard a lot of stuff about that, but anyhow, um, the, I was um, taping the game. I wanted to get out of nature. I was hoping nobody would uh, would ruin it for me, and I was sure I w- nothing was going to ruin it for me, but I was kind of obsessing about, uh, about the game and being able to watch it, and the universe doesn't understand that I don't that doesn't understand no the universe doesn't understand it i do not want um people to um uh like ruin it for me and when i was walking down the nature trail one day um this 85 year old hunchbacked guy who looks like he's got dementia was um was walking by me he saw that i was wearing a shirt from my days in high school football he then went up to me and three words came out of his mouth and those three words are the eagles lost (laughs) <laughs> and and I was like, why? If that guy wasn't an old man, I would have slugged the shit out of him. But anyhow, um, the point I was trying, I'm gonna try to make by saying that is okay. Well, I kind of asked for it because by obsessing about being able to not have anybody tell me ruin it for me, and I being able to watch the game when when I was done enjoying nature, I kind of attracted that 85 year old guy who looks like he's got dementia into my life to to ruin it for me because the universe doesn't understand. No, it only understands the the thoughts when it comes to bringing something through the law of attraction. But then again, that does seem to fly in the face of what I was talking about earlier about how the universe knows what you mean, but yet it doesn't understand. No, a little bit of a contradiction there. So, well, I've babbled long enough. Can you help make any sense about any of this stuff? Cause it seems like you uh, kind of would focus on this kind of material. <laughs> Yeah, I think you make a very good point in that the universe doesn't understand no in the sense that you describe it. If you focus on something and you say, okay, don't let me experience that, I don't want that, you are bringing that specific thing into your awareness. And since your reality is assembled around you as the focus point, if you bring a certain thing into your awareness, it's more likely to reflect around you in your outside reality. Um, I would say if you focus on a positive thought, the universe will understand what you mean and it will help you create that. Um, it seems counterintuitive to like understand the two ways of thinking that the universe hears what you're saying and that it doesn't understand now from the um, human perspective. They seem to clash logically, but... Um, if you understand the principles behind them, the whole composite makes sense. Does that help you understand? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think you couldn't have explained it any better. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, I took the words right out of my mouth. It does seem counterintuitive. But yet there has to be an explanation behind why this is the, uh, the case. And, well, I think in the sense Brad Johnson was talking about it, um, he was talking about it from a law of attraction standpoint. So um, when you want to... Um, when you attract what you experience, then the universe doesn't understand no, but I guess if it's a completely different matter when you're trying to uh, call, an, call an angel in to help you or uh, like give instructions to an angel about how it should heal you, um, that's, uh, well, maybe it is a little law of attraction, but it works on a different, uh, different. Um, uh, it's uh, it, yeah, hard to describe, but hey, it makes for great, uh, great conversation to try to make sense of this, and well, that's what I got to do on a on Nature Reality Radio, and, well, <laughs> I'm sure I'm glad that you uh, contacted me to be a guest because I'm enjoying this very much we talking about this. One more point to make to make yeah. that a little bit more clear. Okay. Um, if you would say communicating with an angel, they are the intermediary between your reality and the reality around you, so you're asking them for a request to then translate into reality. And because they are sentient in... Um, a self-developed way and individualistic way and not sentient in the sense that the universe is sentient. They can kind of filter your request. So if you say, I don't want this to an angel, they will understand and they will then create it like with the no in the right way. But if you were, say, manifesting reality directly from yourself, there is really no intermediary between yourself and the world around you. So the universe around you the way that it is sentient, it doesn't understand the difference between yes or no. It just picks up on kind of unconscious impulses and perceptions and thoughts. 
well, yeah, I think that does help uh, make sense of the phenomenon a little bit better. Um, thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, okay, let's move down the list here. A distant energetic healing. Uh, this healing practice works by strengthening your body's energies, physical, astral, and etheric, with the assistance of assistance of benevolent entities. This is not to be confused um, with Reiki. Well, um, uh, okay. Well, what, what's the what exactly is the difference there? Because some people consider Reiki to be um, energetic healing, and people say you can do Reiki at a distance because, well, space and time are illusions. So, um, what 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 exactly is the slight difference here? Well, Reiki is kind of complex because it was originally channeled by a person in the early twentieth um, century, and because it was a specific transmission in a specific method that means um, it can more easily be controlled or corrupted and the way that someone learns Reiki is by learning specific techniques and ways of moving their hands and different signs that they make and these all carry this um, ritualistic component so basically this ritualistic component can be corrupted by any negative entities who want to interfere with it and because Reiki is so popular it's something that is probably targeted by some negative entities that want to use it to their own ends. And I have heard from some people that Reiki practitioners actually put implants in their clients. Um, the way that Reiki is done sometimes is you use one hand to receive and one hand to transmit. And what ends up happening is you receive implants or negative energies from your client. You get them within yourself, and then you basically use them to infect other people. I'm not saying that all Reiki practitioners are necessarily doing harm because some of them don't really adhere that strongly to the method, and their own positive intentions overpower anything negative within the practice. I'm just saying that it carries a high risk of being contaminated, and it isn't really um, a pure method of transmitting energy to somebody. I think a lot of it comes from a culture where people think that they have to study something in a formal way to then have knowledge to be able to help or transmit to another person. But in reality, you don't need to learn Reiki in a formal way to be able to do energy healing on somebody. So basically... The kind of energy healing that I do is not done through some kind of um, formal training or intermediary. It is just by myself conducting two different energies in the universe or different guides that will then um, directly affect the other person's energetic body. It is just done through the power of thought and intention alone. Thank you, thank you for, uh, for clarifying that. Um, so uh, divination is the next thing down on the list here. Uh, you uh, use the um, Len Normand spread, uh, or Elia alchemy, alchemy cards, uh, sticks and bones, or crystal scrying for divination and uh, tarot reading. Okay, well, uh, I use the Deviant Moon Tarot for... Whenever I need to ask my tarot deck a question, that's the one I decided to buy. It just happens to be the most popular deck in the world, Deviant Moon Tarot, for whatever the reason. Um, so, uh, out of curiosity, why do you choose the spread that you um, that you chose? Um, and uh, what are these uh, Quarelia um, alchemy cards? Never heard of them. Uh, sticks and bones, of all things, uh, seems kind of uh, something you'd see in a skull and bone satanic ritual. But uh, no, it's uh, there's obviously some good behind this. Uh, specific ritual. It's nothing like that, I presume. So, why don't you clarify that? And uh, what is crystal scrying? I've heard of scrying in like the Nostradamus sense, but I don't recall him using crystals for that. I thought he just used water mm -hmm. or something in a bowl. So, all right, I've babbled long enough. How does this all work? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so crystal scrying is basically just looking into a crystal, letting your mind go blank, and allowing anything you see in the crystal to then inform whatever question you're asking. You can do the same thing with different elements, say water and fire, and it works in a similar way. 
Um, the reason I use different methods of divination is because I don't rely so much on these um, external means. They are all just ways of illuminating an inner truth or an inner reality. And basically, the external method or the card deck just has to have enough information within it to be able to reflect the internal reality with the same amount of um, density or the same kind of clarity. So the different decks that I use all reflect different archetypes in the human psyche. Um, the Quarea deck, Quarea is a magical school that is online, and they produce a tarot deck, not really tarot, they don't call it tarot, but it's a number of cards that all reflect a magical archetype. So traditional tarot decks, the archetypes that they have are slightly uh, more mundane, and this specific Quarea deck, the archetypes are more magical in nature, so it's good for, say, giving readings about specifically spiritual questions. Um, any of these other decks just tap into the archetypes in the human mind, which is sort of um, this interface between their mind and the reality beyond their mind. The unconscious is kind of this intermediary place between their conscious question and all of these realities, which are kind of beyond them and coming into being through them. So it's this good um, intermediary point of seeing to some degree into them and how they are creating reality through their own thoughts, how um, reality is being created for them, and all these kinds of things. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like we're going to get a full two-hour interview here. Uh, I was looking on your website for some more things to talk about, um, and I'm just on the Our Vision page. Um, well, Secrets of uh, Shamanism, uh, most people, when they think about shamanism, they think of something dealing with, uh, um, w with healing, um, things about uh, shamans that kind of uh, amaze me. Uh, how do they discover what they learn about what they learn? Well, there's definitely some spiritual assistance uh, for it. Um, saw some documentary about making ayahuasca brew. And uh, how in the hell are you supposed to know that a plant with DMT combined, combined with this vine, of all the plants in the world that, that you got to combine with some vine with the MAOIs in it, how do you how do you figure that out? I mean, do you just experiment with plant after plant after plant? I mean, are there are people in the tribes that are actually willing to test that and risk death from poison if it's not the right concoction. Well, no, they didn't have to do that because some spirit told them about it. I had a guest on my show, one of Chief Golden Light Eagle's good good friends, and he talked about how. Like when I was talking about tobacco and how um, shamans discovered that if you smoke tobacco to the point of near to the point of death, it'll allow you to enter a near death trance state where you can properly diagnose the illnesses of your patients. <laughs> okay, people you are, use cigarettes just to wake them up in the morning, and then all and then someone finds out that it has this mysterious power. If you smoke it to near death level, you can diagnose the illnesses of people who are patient of yours of all how do you learn that well the some spiritual essence told them that so okay well how are these shamans connecting with these uh spirits what are these spirits made of comprised of how can you describe their consciousness essence if you have to give a scientific description so uh, i'm asking too many questions here could you uh, make sense of, of all this please mm -hmm. well i described some of the Spirits earlier, they usually fall into one of several categories. Um, one is ancestors, one is higher guides, so for fifth dimensional beings who either used to be human or from other planets, another form of these spirits is animal spirits. Um, and what their consciousness consists of varies depending on who they are. Um, some of them, how would I say it, are more alive in the present moment than others. Some ancestors, for instance, when you communicate with them, you're mostly just communicating with the knowledge they had when they were alive on Earth. So you're interacting with this database of what their consciousness was when it was here. 
So you're more interacting with this um, repository of information, whereas other spirits you interact with are um, fully in the present with you and they are teaching you and they are conscious in much the same way that you are, but just in a different place and not in a physical body. And even some of these spirits do have physical bodies. They are just not incarnated in a third dimension or earth, so we can't see them. Well, well thank you for uh, for making sense of that. And um, interesting thing, I mentioned about ayahuasca. Another thing that the guy pointed out in the documentary is the shamans make it very clear that um, some people think, well, I can't make ayahuasca with the plants in the rainforest and the vine because, well, I don't have access to that, but I can certainly make a pharmaceutical brand of it using synthetic uh, DMT and some sort of a, a synthetic uh, MAOI that will make it orally active. Are you going to get a hallucinogenic substance out of it? Yeah. The problem, however, the shamans would assert is that the spiritual essence is in the vine, the vine that has the MAOIs. And without that spiritual essence, you will not have a, an, uh, as beneficial, for lack of a better word, an experience as you would have using strictly synthetic things. Um, although, is it possible, one could argue that a truly disciplined shaman could perhaps do a spiritual transfer to maybe transfer the spirit from the vine to the synthetic MAOI so that you can, if you take a, phar a strictly synthetic pharmaceutical, pharma huwaska they call it, not ayahuasca, which is all natural, but mm -hmm. pharma huwaska, you can have a experience that's just as beneficial as um, a genuine um, all-natural ayahuasca experience. Others assert, nah, they can never compare because you, you, you can't transfer the spirit as well as it would be when it's when it's in the true natural vine. So um, can you uh, help make, make sense of this phenom phenomenon and how to what extent is it possible to do that and is it really all in the vine because that's where the spirit is and that's just the way reality works in that and other things? Um, I think that, yes, it is in the vine. And if you just take a generic kind of DMT that is not prepared by a shaman, it will be an entirely different experience than taking the ayahuasca um, that is brewed. However, if you have a shaman, say, take the synthetic DMT and imbue it with the spirit, if the shaman is really competent and knows what they are doing, I don't see why they couldn't give you an experience that would be at least similar to ayahuasca, even if it's not exactly the same as taking ayahuasca. So it is possible. It's all in the, the way you can uh, um, harness and... Um manipulate and alchemize the uh the spiritual essence in regards to creating your concoctions if you're a sorcerer that knows what he's doing and uh has no evil intentions then chances are it'll probably work out in that thing and, and, and just other things that was just an example that i could have given there's yeah. other examples of that but uh yeah. yeah so uh well um i i guess maybe we can bring this interview to uh to an end now, but I'd like to give you the chance to get out uh, anything that you like uh, and uh, give out your uh, your contact info as well. You, you got eight minutes until eight o'clock, which will be the two hour point. So uh, I'll let if you need all that time, by all means, take it. But um, this was a great interview. I enjoyed it very much. Glad you were able to contact me to be a guest. I love this. Learned a few things myself. Uh, now it's your turn. You got the floor. Your contact yeah, info. Thank you so much for hosting me here. I really enjoyed talking. Um, I don't really have that much that I want to say on my own. So if you have more questions, um, go ahead and ask them. Hmm. Well, uh, okay. Well, since uh, I was talking about football earlier, uh, you have no idea what it means for the city of Philadelphia. But I think uh, from a standpoint of human consciousness and a, and a patriot community thing, and also from a metaphysical standpoint, I think if I were to force to pick which would be the great of all the four teams remaining, the, a, a Super Bowl victory by this team would be the best for society. Some would say, what are you talking about? The NFL all it does is give society a bad name. Well, no. Uh, I say the Philadelphia Eagles would actually be great for society winning because, well, I mean, you got the Eagle. What's the color for the Eagles? Green. What's the green the color of? The heart chakra. So naturally, if you uh, paint green all over the place uh, in Philly and and elsewhere, then the metaphysical qualities of that would cause people to 
to go with the heart more, I, I would think. Or or is it not going to work like that because the archons that greatly control the NFL are going to uh, screw around with, uh, with humanity? And uh, also, I mean, uh, Philadelphia, that's the cradle of liberty. The Patriot community, they could certainly, I would think... Uh, be able to look up to the Eagles as a way of giving them a nice kick in the pants, saying, okay, if the Eagles can pull off a miracle like this and finally give some, after all these years, get a title, then this is an inspiration for the Patriot community to start the spirit of 1776 all over again, and there were some things that, like the solar eclipse that happened in August uh, 2017, that the way that eclipse crossed America in such a way was the first time since, well, the American Revolution, and uh, right before, like 1776, right before then, and I think it was 1775 or something like that, and when that, such an eclipse happened, and uh, talking about, um, well, the time frame and all with Pluto and Capricorn, the destruction of everything humanity's best interest, I mean, Philadelphia Eagles uh, Super Bowl, what it mean for Philadelphia, consequently, what it would mean for the Patriot community, and having all that green everywhere. <laughs> Do you think I'm going to look, taking a little stretch saying, hey, everybody start rooting for the Eagles now, because it would be the best thing for, like, the best thing for the world now. Or you're not going to say that because you're a Patriots fan. <laughs> I don't know. Just a question to end on an entertaining note. Any comments about this? I really have no idea. I think this question is outside the domain of my expertise. And I think your conjectures are just as good as anything. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, okay, talking about putting green everywhere. I mean, uh, you, you're talking about how the Archons can manipulate reality. I mean, you, where else do you see green? Money. Does it make any sense to make money green? No, because green, that's balance, that's the heart. And money, our financial system is totally untenable. Um, fi fractional reserve banking, loaning money that doesn't exist and charging interest, which makes debt and inflation unavoidable. Why would they make it green? Because they're trying to create a... Trust it. They're trying to what? What did you say? To make people trust the money. If they can make the people connect with the money at a heart level, then they are not going to see as much into the manipulation, the magic that's going on behind it. Right, right, right. So um, I'm just pointing this out with like, the color green because, well, everybody, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of green right now with this. <laughs> and, I'm, um, and I keep thinking every time I see the color green more prominently around where I am because everybody's got filled off Eagles fever, I'm thinking, no, this, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe green everywhere is going to make people use the, the heart more. And, uh, and uh, I don't know, maybe I'm just uh, going a little crazy here. But um, either way, it's all well, I'm sure there are some levels intentional. Like, say, the blue in Facebook is entirely intentional. Um, somebody came up with that idea for some reason, but I'm not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it seems that the theme, the general theme about the Eagles this year has been brotherhood. And they're that, that kind of a, an exception to the way of the NFL makes people look bad because they've been a very brotherhood-oriented team, I've noticed, being a fan who watches them throughout the year. So I think they are athletes who we can look up to in a sports league that gives society a bad name. But <laughs> what do I know? So uh, just something entertaining to talk about at the end of this show. So uh, um, pleasure having you on. And, uh, well, I wish you the best of luck. I'll upload this to YouTube uh, soon enough, and uh, I guess I'll send you a message when I do. And uh, well, you already probably have my access. No, my, my channel is Nature of Reality Radio. That's what it is on YouTube. So just keep an eye on that. I'll try to get uploaded mm -hmm. by tomorrow. And it was mm -hmm. a pleasure talking to you. Namaste. Good luck. And uh, by the way, one more thing. I just occurred to me. Alexander, would he be willing to come on as a guest? Um, I don't know. I would have to talk to him. Please I will do. let you know. Brother. All right. All right. Take care now. Namaste. Thank you. Have a Bye -bye. good night.